All right, so I'm going to introduce Senator Presser, and then I'm going to join him um, and, and start uh, with uh, a few minutes for him to introduce and, and talk a little bit about himself. And then we'll carry on a little bit of a conversation. We hope to have time for you to join that conversation uh, and invite you to, uh, when the time comes, I'll, I'll invite you to form a queue at the, at the mic here and introduce yourself. Like I said, we, our, our intention was for student leaders, students interested in civic engagement and public service to come together and learn uh, from a distinguished public service and, uh, servant and someone who has had a very remarkable career, as you uh, will see if you didn't already know. Uh, so former United States Senator Larry Presser currently lives in Washington, D.C., where he's a lawyer, a speaker, and a writer. He is dedicating his life to finding ways to save our democracy and recently has published a book entitled Senator Pressler, An Independent Mission to Save Our Democracy. He served in the U.S. Senate for 18 years, three terms, where he served as chairman of the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committees. He was also an active member of the Foreign Relations Committee. He was the first Vietnam veteran elected to the U.S. Senate. He was the principal author of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. He was also author of the Pressler Amendment, which limited foreign countries from using the USA to develop nuclear weaponry. Prior to his election to the U.S. Senate, he served as two terms as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. He was the principal co-author of the Vocational Technical Education Act of 1976. In 1980, he drew fame and praise for flatly turning down a bribe in the Abscam scandal. And I know he'll be speaking to the Master of Public Administration students on, uh, on ethics and those issues involved in, in that interesting episode. Recently, he was a member of the Military Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission. He currently serves on the Jericho Project's Veterans Homeless Advisory Council in New York City, which recently opened two homeless veterans facilities. He's also served on the boards of the Philadelphia Stock Exchange and Infosys Technologies in Bangalore, India. In 2014, Senator Pressler ran an independent moderate, as an independent moderate for the U.S. Senate in South Dakota. With strong endorsements, he helped the lead, um, he held the lead a month before the election, but dropped in the polls after targeted negative ads from both political parties who feared the election of another independent to the U.S. Senate. It was editorialized that Pressler lost the election but won the campaign because of his positive centrist candidacy. He's an active member of the New York, Washington, D.C. and United States Supreme Court bars. A graduate of Harvard Law School and a Rhodes Scholar, he has lectured at over 20 universities, including Harvard and UCLA, and I'm pleased to add now BYU. He was a Fulbright, Fulbright professor, both in Italy and in France. In April of 2015, as you may have heard or read, he converted to the Mormon faith. He and his wife have one daughter, Laura, and four grandchildren. So please join me in warmly welcoming to BYU and the Kennedy Center, Senator Larry Pressler. serving God and the, and the public, and uh, that will help our country because there's so much apathy. Let me say that uh, just uh, two things. Uh, 
I know many of you are interested in international relations, and I'm working on a small book, which t takes me three or four years to write a book, but uh, I'm working on one on international relations. And I just am working this month on a chapter about the influence that hiring lobbying firms in Washington have on foreign relations. I wouldn't think of that. You'd think if you were gonna have a career in foreign relations, you'd go into the State Department. But it has grown up that Washington is such a heavily lobbied town that, like for example, the Indian ambassador, the very first thing he does is to hire a big Washington law firm or a, a consulting firm or a lobbying firm or maybe several to help get money or, or uh, trade or whatever it is they're doing. So there's almost a, a whole new industry that's sprung up in Washington around the lobbying activities. And I, I know that's a bad word uh, to some people, but that's a career or it's a place where many of you might find yourself some days. And there are a lot of good lobbyists and they do a lot of good. Uh, but I've been disturbed at the, at the power of the uh, special interests and the special interests meaning probably you and me, whatever we're interested in. Uh, I, I've done some volunteer lobbying for Vietnam veterans and so forth. But I just thought of that this morning as you were talking about uh, 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 international relations. But uh, the future might hold something totally different from you, for you than, uh, than you think. Um, I wrote a small book about the importance of, really what I was trying to say is the importance of, we have so much apathy of people learning the real issues. Like in this presidential campaign, people follow a little bit out of CNN and a little bit of, uh, out of Fox News and we're very critical of, of the candidates, but most people, they don't know anything about the Senate races in their state or about the state legislative contests. And that's what happens like in Flint, Michigan, where you have this water problem all of a sudden. Well, that's been going on for 30 or 40 years. There should have been the local county commission should have uh, been interested in that and issued bonds to build new pipes a long time ago. But that's the importance of local uh, input. And you don't have to be a United States senator to, to do that. Uh, whether it's service on a school board or service on a county commission or whatever, there's much good that needs to be done in our country. And let me say that I think a small businessman who creates jobs and pays taxes also uh, contributes a great deal and can in the end. And, and then at the end of their life, they, if they got some money, they can contribute to a good cause. Uh, so, and in my lifetime, I've never built up very much money. We've always made a living, but uh, I'm not able to give to charity as much as I want. And I'm kind of jealous of some of my colleagues who spent a lifetime in business who are able to, to do more charitable events. Um, we have a Supreme Court uh, nomination co coming up in Washington, D.C., and there's a great debate uh, about whether that should be approved before the, this president uh, leaves office or whether it should be uh, delayed or whatever. And um, I'm one of those. Uh, my first reaction is that we should, since it was a death, we should move forward with it if we can. It's really a battle between uh, the philosophy of who's appointed, and it's felt that the, uh, I think on the Republican side, they feel if they could delay it, they might be able to get a more conservative member appointed to the Supreme Court, and the uh, Democrats feel that, uh, that that they're entitled to this nomination at this time. And even though I've served as a Republican, I would tend to, uh, I tend to feel that uh, it should move forward. But we do have someone in the audience, a professor who's writing a book on Supreme Court nominations. And uh, now, now help me out. Professor but, Richard Davis. Professor Richard Davis, where is he? He's right there. Now, uh, we'll just, I'll just sit down. You know. You're not gonna leave the discussion <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> but uh, what's, what's going on with that? Uh, what are you gonna write about that, this? I thought you were the one speaking to us. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, I'll just answer yeah, your question. No, no. I, think it's, uh, I, I think you've described it well, that, uh, that the two sides are in a pitch battle right now, and my sense is that we're not going to get anything uh, to happen. But, but I'm also writing about the historical evolution of the process, and I think what we're seeing here is the process at its worst, uh, a process that has broken down. Uh, and if there isn't significant change, uh, we're probably get to the point where if the Senate is controlled by an opposition party, we will not be able to get a new a replacement for a Supreme Court judge, which is, which is absolutely uh, 
opposite of uh, what the Constitution uh, expected. Yes, I think that is correct. Now, I didn't mean to throw the ball to you, but I just met you coming in here, so I what what because I'm interested in what you're what you're doing, and we're looking forward to that. And uh, I was in the Senate for many confirmations of the Supreme Court, not and I always felt we should vote on them, uh, vote up, vote up or down. And uh, for example, I voted for Robert Bork, and I voted for um, who else got who else didn't make it? Somebody else didn't make it. I can't remember, but. Uh, uh, it was an up or down vote, so I'm not mad about that. My side lost, and then somebody, I think Kennedy came along and got, got that seat instead. But in any event, I'd like to take some questions from you or comments. Uh, I could also speak a little bit about my fe feeling uh, of the political parties. Uh, I'm going to speak, uh, I think, tomorrow morning. I think it's a professor, and I've asked a uh, professor here wrote a fine article, and I read it in the BYU, uh, I believe, Professor Magleby. David Magleby. Mm -hmm. David Professor Magleby, Magleby is going to be in my class. He's written a wonderful paper, and he says, although you're very frustrated with, with two political parties, you should join the one that you like the least, and uh, no, 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 the one that you dislike the least. <laughs> and, uh, be a, but his point is to be a member of a party, to be effective. And right now, and I can share some of that thing, but right now my thinking is that in my state of South Dakota, uh, I ran as an independent for the Senate the last time because I was feeling that we need to end the poisonous deadlock in Washington between Republicans and Democrats. And I'm a member of the centrist group, and the centrist foundation, which we're trying to get more moderate thinking in politics and in the universities and elsewhere. And it seemed to me that uh, that uh, this growing number of independent voters, if they grew larger still, then both the parties would have to try to please them, and this would create more moderate or willingness to compromise type thinking. Uh, I basically come at politics, I, I sort of think a little to down the center. I was a moderate Republican when I was serving, uh, we, we thought, but I thought, I think that we made most of the decisions. We had to work things out, but it was the least glamorous at least reported. So, uh, uh, but I urge all of you to be active politically and uh, you can join one party or the other or be an independent. And uh, being an independent is a little tougher role to hold. And, and by the way, you can't get on the ballot just automatically as an independent. You know, you have to get a lot of signatures. It's a process very similar to the primary in most states. But uh, that, that, that is my thinking. So we're gonna be discussing that tomorrow. But I know a lot of you may not actually run for office, I, I hope you do, but even if you don't, you can help other people to run. But it's become a very difficult thing to run for office in this day and age because, uh, I guess, uh, like on the computer, the internet, uh, people make anonymous charges and negative campaigning, and uh, we have uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, problems to, uh, to actually running for office, and you can lose your reputation. So uh, uh, some of our best people just won't run for office, and that's a serious problem. But I want to uh, respond to some of your questions. I left my bottle of water in my bag up there. I've got another one for you. Got another well, one. How about that? While, while, miraculous. We, <laughs> while you're thinking about your questions, let me, let me for the sen senators say, I'm just curious. Uh, they'll do an informal poll. We usually ask for ambassadors, how many of you speak Latvian, or how many of you speak Tagalog, but how many of you are planning on a career in public service by show of hands? Okay, so, so, so as the former Boren Scholarship representative, I used to go to many uh, meetings across the country. Now the Boren Scholarship is for students who want to go into national security, named after the former Senator uh, Boren of Oklahoma. And uh, what was always interesting was much of the meeting that I would attend would be a discussion on how do we persuade students to go into public service careers. That has never been a problem in my experience at BYU because there, do seem, there does seem to be so many students who are interested. I do know that there is some data that backs that up. So last year, the American Foreign Service Association issued a report and BYU was the number seven school in the United States for alumni in the U.S. Foreign Service. So uh, you probably contributed to that, um, although uh, you didn't serve. But, but, but it, it begs the question for me, um, I always wonder, it, are the, are the upcoming freshman classes at BYU as interested in public service as 
you are or, or previous uh, generations of students. What would you say, uh, because it does seem to, to us that across the country there is a decreasing interest in public service for some of the reasons you mentioned, uh, the, the slight of reputation, the money that you've talked about that are in politics. Um, what, what do you think are some of the, the upsides of public service to encourage um, our students to be, to be more engaged or to think more seriously about that as a career option? Well, um, uh, and I do hope many of you do, and thank you for mentioning the Boren scholarships. I did serve with Senator Boren, and I think his thinking was to get people into uh, national security issues. And one thing that I've been writing about is how most countries in the world, including our own, we become a military, industrial, intelligence, national security state. And uh, that, that is something new in, in a sense. And Hans Mortenthal wrote about politics among nations. And it was the first book I read. And that was sort of the old classic book about how nations, nation states behave with each other. But that's changed now, I think, because now we're in a new era, and especially uh, just the news yesterday of the killings in Belgium and so forth, uh, more and more, we are a national security state, but I mean we have very high security. We, we collect intelligence on our own citizens and others, and we uh, we have a military-industrial state, as Eisenhower predicted. But it's more than that. It's also a, a, a homeland security intelligence state, and that will mean probably less civil liberties at some point. And, and, and India is a, is the same way, and so, so are the European states. And most countries are. Uh, it's uh, the military and the intelligence agencies that really are the, uh, in the strongest, uh, have the most input. And I think that many of you should consider, for that reason, we need good people in that. We need good people in the CIA, plus we have 26 other intelligence agencies. That's a career that uh, is, it would be very, very important. Uh, of course, we have obviously the military, but we have the whole homeland security all the issues in homeland security. And uh, so I'm glad that uh, the Boren Fellowships, are, I think I've defined kind of the area that, that they cover. Well, let me say the, uh, one of the big disadvantages of a, of a public service career is that you probably won't make as much money. But I maintain that you'll make an adequate amount of money, I mean, uh, to support yourself and your family, and you'll have a, an adequate uh, pension, but it won't be kind of big the problem is that you won't be able to give money away or you won't be in a position to uh, to do some things that if you are in private business you can build up some money so that's one thing but uh, uh, the compensation for foreign service officers or whatever uh, is adequate to live on certainly but uh, you have to uh, keep your spending restrained somewhat but um, uh, what you do get paid in is the satisfaction of working on big public issues and, and uh, making a difference. And you know, I've said earlier that I think a person who goes into business also makes a difference in the sense that they're creating jobs and paying taxes. And they can make uh, more money and, and maybe do more for charity or give more to that tithe or whatever they're trying to do. Uh, but uh, uh, so we do get a lot of high quality people who will take appointments in the federal government. We have the revolving door. But that's not the same as going in there and working and really making a career out of it. And that's what we're talking about here uh, in one aspect. Now, um, uh, it seems to me that it's very important that we have those people. I mean, the young fellow who met me at the airport yesterday, TC, Coriates, did I say that right? No. TC, who, who's, uh, whoops, we must have a different class here. Uh, <laughs> but he was telling me that uh, he, he wants to work for the GAO. Now that's a stroke of genius. What's the GAO? It's a government accounting office. That is really an important, they're the last guys in Washington to talk straight, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> you can, Congress asks them for opinions on different things and factual reports and to work there you can have immense influence and uh, uh, 
but it's very hard because every sentence that you write has got to be justified about five or six different ways. But that's but that's very important. Uh, I think that uh, uh, that there are a lot of things like that that you don't even think of the GAO, where we really need good people. Obviously, we need good people in places like the FBI and, and, and uh, the CIA and, and uh, the other uh, great uh, agencies. We need good people like we have all of them, like the Federal Trade Commission. This has an enormous impact on people's lives. Uh, the uh, Federal Communications Commission. All these. We do have, whether we like it or not, uh, I think Bernie Sanders is right in one sense. We, we are becoming sort of like Denmark, whether we want to or not, in that the government is very much involved in our lives, and uh, the state government, federal state. And usually when I go out to make some of these speeches, I uh, uh, pick just an item out of the daily newspaper, whether the federal, state, and local uh, issue involved in it. But that, in, but that depends on good people working in those agencies and they're unrecognized. Now another problem is that if, you're, if you don't run for office, you probably won't get much public recognition and uh, uh, your wife will appreciate you, but uh, uh, you'll feel maybe a little bit unappreciated or underappreciated, but that's part of doing God's work and, the, uh, and the, the, the reward is a better country. So those are some things that come off the top of my mind. So I do. I do want you to pursue that, and uh, I'm glad to hear that. Now, what does the Boring Fellowship do exactly? Does it give you a year's It pays for a study abroad on a national security priority language, so students at BYU who are studying Arabic or Russian, Chinese, Korean, as well as a lot of students who are starting in languages like Hindi, or there's an African tribal language initiative, there's an initiative for STEM, so engineering majors, technology majors. It's, it's one of many opportunities um, some of you may be FLAS scholars, which we receive through the Department of Education. That's another great uh, opportunity for area studies. The Critical Language Scholarship is another uh, State Department funding to develop language. Uh, so there's lots of, we see that through the Kennedy Center, a lot of students who are interested in finding ways to pay for study abroads and, and international uh, expertise that they're developing. Um, since, it is, since it is the caucus day, I have to ask, um, talk a little, a little politics. Um, your, your thoughts on the national, the presidential campaign, um, and maybe even on what's happening in Utah. I guess there was a poll in the Desert News a few days ago that showed that uh, in matchups, uh, both Hillary and Bernie Sanders would beat Donald Trump uh, in a theoretical matchup. Uh, we're not here to talk necessarily local politics, but um, we we'll want to get to the foreign policy dimension. But your thoughts on, on the current political climate and the campaign that's been going on, it seems like, forever? Well, um, it's a very good question. And let me say that I'm disappointed in the current uh, political atmosphere. I had hoped Michael Bloomberg would run. I was going to support him, and only two weeks ago he announced he was not. So I am flabbergasted. I'm 73 years of age, and I don't really have a presidential candidate at this moment, but I feel an obligation to get one. <laughs> you have to make a decision. And, and uh, I'm eligible vote in the South Dakota primary, which is not until June, and I can vote in either primary as an independent. I ask for a ballot. So, uh, uh, but I would guess that uh, maybe if uh, uh, John Kasich were still running, then I might well uh, vote for him. Uh, I think uh, I sense that Hillary will probably get the uh, nomination. But uh, I do think that uh, as much as people might criticize Donald Trump, he is responding to something out there, uh, the apathy and, and actually kind of a desire for an independent without being able to have one on the ballot. Um, uh, I think there's an atmosphere, but I, I criticize the public, it's the public's fault for being so apathetic, but to, not to really know the real issues on taxation or anything. Uh, and I gotta give Donald Trump credit, he has raised some issues that other people won't touch, for example, I'll give you one, and this is a little bit of, this will, this will sound like insider's ball, but the issue of eminent domain. Uh, and, uh, like I'm, uh, when I was in the Senate, I worked on a lot of, what you might say, everyday issues that weren't quite so glamorous on the Commerce Committee. I authored the Telecommunications Act, which really gave us the internet, and that was a hard bill, but that was a five-year bill to pass. Uh, the 
these bills are not just, just don't stand up and give a speech. I mean, this is, you've got to work it through the House and the Senate. And, uh, uh, the, for example, the Pipeline Safety Act. Now, I believe very strongly that we need to have more gas and uh, oil pipelines in our country. And that sounds like a very dull thing to be talking about. But uh, we, use, we truck all this material, or we move it by train. And we can't build more pipelines because people don't want to give eminent domain. That is, they're private companies. But they, uh, so Trump said early on, and it's a, yeah, it's a canon of the Republican Party, it's like eminent domain should not be granted for private projects. Just like no new taxes. That's the problem with the two party caucuses. They have some of these rather obscure things, but you have to be pledged to them, sign a pledge to them. Okay. So most Republican candidates will sign a pledge to no eminent domain where it's private companies, only where it's public buildings. Well, if you, for example, if you wanted to build the, uh, the pipeline from Canada, that, that would have required a lot of eminent domain. And so there are these inconsistencies because most of the people who want to, want to build that would be classified as conservative Republicans. Well, Trump and his, and his and of course they said, well, he just wants to build his casinos with his eminent domain. Or whatever, but and so there's no real. That's an issue that should be discussed in the presidential campaign in detail, and that would be my ideal thing. Uh, but nobody knows anything about it or cares. So Trump has brought up some new issues that other candidates are afraid to bring up, uh, but uh, people don't pay much attention to those issues. The problem that we have is that we've also lost our reporters, and I would hope that how many people in this room would like to become a journalist or a reporter. That's really important. That's more important. Good. I'm glad. But you, you won't get paid any money and you'll be abused. <laughs> but uh, we need good journalists more than we do need uh, anything else, probably. Because but they, they don't get paid anything. People will not, other than the New York Times and the Washington Post, and maybe the, the Salt, uh, I don't know what the public papers are here, but they just do not have enough money or they don't pay enough money reporters to do that in-depth reporting and uh, uh, so and then also the young journalists that tell me that we have to be of the right or of the left you have, you have to head for Fox News or you have to head for CNN and if, if you want to be an old-fashioned independent print reporter uh, there's no place for you and that is very unfortunate but that's an example the real uh, the, the, I also happened to be dull, old-fashioned uh, 1970s and 1980s politician, but I believe the deficit is the number one problem you will face in your lifetimes in terms of policy. And that's because I believe that we're going to have, if we keep adding to the deficit, and we did the very same thing, this conservative, so-called conservative Republican Congress passed one of the biggest spending bill without any restraints without any effort to trim military spending or any efforts to balance out some, uh, maybe some new revenue. Uh, in December, they called it a compromise, but it was just go into the candy store and take as much as you can of all the various departments and so forth. And uh, they, they just added it on to the federal deficit. Now, I, I believe, sitting here, uh, that sometime in the next 20 years, there's going to be a very severe economic collapse because of our, our deficit, and we're going to have to substantially raise taxes or do something, very, and it's going to mean our economy is going to slow down, and it's going to mean a lowering of the standard of living. I think this is going to happen as surely as I'm sitting here, but nobody talks about that, and the tax plans people have are just pie in the sky. It's just, the press don't understand them. People say uh, uh, they, they have the, you know, this is just, just, just doesn't add up. You can't have a flat tax unless you eliminate all the deductions and you still, it's still not enough revenue. Uh, so all these pie in the sky ideas people throw around, uh, they're not analyzed by the press or by anybody. And that is most unfortunate. What, what, what do you make of the current president, President Obama, and particularly his foreign policy? He made a major speech today from Havana um, as, as a Republican serving senator, but someone who, Sounds like later in your career, um, worked, worked for or supported mm -hmm. President Obama. 
But what, what do you make? Uh, I know there was an article in the Atlantic last week, uh, kind of the discussion is only starting to talk about his legacy and kind of the first the first stages of that discussion. What, what, what do you make of President Obama's foreign policy? Okay, well, uh, I think President Obama will go down as a good president who accomplished several of his goals from his point of view. He accomplished, he got the medical care thing passed, although it's never been fully embraced. Uh, he got the Iran deal done, although many people criticize it. Uh, he has done the Cuba recognition, uh, but he's done several other things in his uh, foreign policy that he has succeeded, that he wanted to do, that he had a, on his list. Now, whether you agree with that list or not, but he was elected. And um, I think he will go down as a good president, but not as a great president. Uh, uh, he just didn't quite have it. The great president's almost got to have a war or some kind of catastrophic uh, <laughs> uh, thing uh, to, uh, we like our war presidents the best. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, for example, when Eisenhower was president, a lot of people didn't think he was so great, but when he was a general, they thought winning battles uh, was a little more exciting. So mm -hmm. it depended, he was a peacetime president, so it was, but I think his legacy is coming back a little bit. But I don't think the presidents should worry so much about their legacy. We should worry about their legacy or who's greater than who's else. It's who, I think Obama, every morning he got up, he tried his best to serve his country and his God, and uh, he takes it, he probably took a different position than most people in this room or than maybe I would have taken. I happen to know him from uh, the Harvard Law connection, uh, through some connections there before he was president. And uh, I, I, I don't like him very much as an individual, and I shouldn't claim to uh, be that close a friend, but uh, I am a friend of his. And uh, uh, so uh, now in foreign policy, uh, I guess we mentioned the, because we have to talk about the Middle East. I, I, I think Obama came into office, he was the kind of president, he didn't want to put boots on the ground. I think he was like a Vietnam War protester, he, he may not have been, but uh, I think he was of the view that we couldn't extend our military outward. And I think that he was overtaken by the military industrial state and overtaken by necessity. He had to send, he had to end up ordering bombing strikes and these endless uh, things that were in the over there. I think he's resisted more boots on the ground. And as a Vietnam veteran myself, I'm very much opposed to more boots on the ground. I think that we, I think we have to defend ourselves, and we, we'll have to modernize, and we can use drones. Or that, that sounds awful, but uh, that's why I'm so glad that uh, the Boren program is working on teaching uh, Arabic because it is so wonderful to have more of the people who can speak Arabic. Because I think in your lifetimes, the Muslim relationships with people of the Muslim faith will just be critical. And a lot of them speak Arabic, I believe. I hope I haven't. Uh, I know there's Persians and lots of other people uh, in, in that group. But uh, I think he's been more or less stopped dead in his tracks in foreign policy by that Middle Eastern situation. Because I don't think anybody's got a simple solution to that. And I'm especially frightened by presidential candidates who say they're going to bomb them until they're blistered or whatever. <laughs> My friend Ted Cruz said something like that. Uh, but they all like to, the president doesn't have that much power in the presidency. They have to have the concurrence of uh, the Congress and uh, the agencies to do a lot of these things. It's like uh, appointment of a Supreme Court person, and appointment of anybody. The Senate, it says in the Constitution, with the consent of the Senate. someone's consent to get married, for example, that means they have the power to say no. Uh, that means they almost become an equal even though they don't initiate it. It's a very delicate relationship. And uh, so the Senate deal is generally over, over the years, uh, I think I could say that the advice and consent clause means that if the president wants to appoint you Secretary of Agriculture, he has to have the consent of the Senate. Well, what does that mean? Should we confer with the, with the, with the should we just appoint you out of the blue? Uh, should we appoint somebody who's just totally unacceptable to the Senate? Uh, or should he, the ideal thing is if there's consultation before and it's basically worked out. And that's the way it has to be in the end. So that's a very 
fluid thing in our in our government uh, uh, advice and consent clause. But I think Obama's done about as good as anybody. And many of the people criticizing him most loudly don't say what they would do instead. For example, uh, let's say we repeal Obamacare tomorrow. We're still going to in, in the small Idaho towns. We're going to need some kind of medical program for the senior citizens who don't have any. Uh, we're going to need that elsewhere. What would they do instead in the Middle East? Uh, would, they, would they send in? I would, some of them have said John McCain would send more troops back in and so forth. But most of them don't really say what they would do other than they would. And Donald Trump says, I'll be so powerful that on the first day they'll just, just take a step backward or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, I'm not, and I don't yet have a candidate for president. So uh, I guess I'm somewhat bewildered by this whole thing because it's new to me. And that's one thing in my life. You don't stop learning when you leave BYU. Uh, I'm still. I, I'm still a student, actually. I take some classes at George, Georgetown. I'm taking a class in, in English literature west or something like that. I do it during the lunch hour, two days a week, I find a class. But uh, you're very lucky to be learning. But I'm still learning. I converted to the Mormon faith at age 72. That's audacious. Uh, <laughs> you're supposed to be all settled by the time. By the time you're my age, you should be all settled and have your political beliefs firmly in place. And, just beliefs firmly in place, and I'm still searching. So, uh, uh, so some of you, and I know that this, we talk about ethics, and my point is that you have to listen to the little inner voices, because some of the little inner voices could be demonic, maybe sometimes, but uh, I hope they're, they're, they're from the Holy Ghost. But we have to kind of listen to those. So I say, that, I just tell God in the morning that I want him to be my quarterback. But darn it, make the calls clear. <laughs> uh, something like that. So you'll have to search as you go, and you'll probably do a different career than you think. Uh, I thought I was going to be in from the Foreign Service all the way, and my dad got sick and needed me. Uh, he got Alzheimer's disease, and I was needed around to help out in certain ways. It's a too long a story to tell you, but uh, uh, all of a sudden I was uh, back in Humboldt, South Dakota, and uh, then eventually I did a number of things and best to run for office and so forth. But you'll probably do two or three things. Uh, and you'll probably work longer than, uh, because we don't have enough money to pay Social Security, but also they're raising the age up in retirement. Uh, I think it's now at 67, and it's, it's at the uh, uh, 68 or 69 probably. So you, you'll have probably one or two careers before, you, uh, before you're finished. But I'd love to get some questions too. Sure, please. Um, we'll take a few minutes that we've got left. Tell us your name, what you're studying, and then uh, please. Hi, my, this is on. Yeah. My name is Jordan Rao. I'm studying uh, East Asian security issues. My question is uh, so I was serving in the military during the Bush administration, trans over to the Obama administration. So I'm wondering in the public service what your impression is on how the life of a public servant changes when the administration also changes and how much their life is sheltered from that change and how much of their life is influenced by that change. Yes, well, that, now that's another thing about being a public servant that you will have to work very hard at, is that if you're in the Foreign Service, you serve the President of the United States and the Congress, and you don't, you will have your political views, but you don't want to use those or make those known or, or to uh, be biased on one side or another. You serve, you, get, you serve the people, and that gets being, Hard. Sometimes, I know during the Vietnam War, a lot of the Foreign Service officers were against the war and they didn't want to serve in Vietnam. And Lyndon Johnson said, he sent a letter over there and said he didn't want to hear of anybody if they if didn't want to serve in Vietnam and get out of the Foreign Service. He meant it. Uh, so the point was, uh, if you're in the if you're in the federal bureaucracy. You're supposed to remain neutral, and I serve. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of the Baruch School of Public Administration. You probably haven't heard of that. It's the largest school of public administration in the world. <laughs> it's in New York City, and it's the largest because it serves the New York public authorities, uh, which uh, are, are uh, it's the way Governor Nelson Rockefeller had to get some things done with Mr. Moses because they couldn't get the state legislature. <coughs> so they created their 27 public authorities in New York. 
have the power to tax and to like the twin towers were built by the, the uh, New York, New Jersey uh, public authority, they're called. And uh, that's a great place to work and to make a difference. Uh, certain states have, have those. But in any event, if you work in one of those, you've got to be politically neutral. If you're in the military, you're supposed to be politically neutral until you retire. And you should be. Uh, even if you disagree with the president of the United States, you carry out the orders. Uh, but so sometimes they're less enthusiastic to carry it out than others, and that's kind of scary. Uh, but in our system, that's the way it's supposed to be. And uh, Truman fired uh, MacArthur, and they said, well, you can't do that. Well, I, I did it. But, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 the military could have pushed back on that one a little bit and uh, done something. Uh, my name is Collier Beardsley. I'm a, I'm an neuroscience student. Uh, I actually my mission president was Frank Poznanski. Oh, your mission president, president. Your mission was where? Uh, Paris. Okay. And while you were at Sciences Po, uh, he came to me and he knew I was interested in politics. He said, "I'm teaching a, a senator at Sciences Po," and I, I was like, oh, "Which one?" That's so cool, and he wouldn't tell me who, and he wouldn't let me come, and I knocked doors in the rain all night, uh, and it ended up being you. So, well, I'm so sorry nice you couldn't come. Yes, I had a great time teaching. I taught for a semester at Sciences Po, and where were you? And I, I, I've been to church there in that uh, Mormon. Uh, I was uh, in the process at, of at Saint Marie. At the time, I was in Avery, which is kind of a, uh, uh, it's a kind of a ghetto in in the banlieue. Um, I, I do have a. I know this is, this, is, this is an international forum, but I do have a domestic uh, question. Um, Bernie Sanders has kind of thrown the gauntlet down about uh, the legitim legitimacy of our economic system. Um, uh, do we need to change anything, and if so, what? If it's a brief answer, I understand, since this is international. No, no, that's right, and thank you. You warmed the cockles of my old heart. I didn't know anybody knew that I taught at Seance Pool. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. it was difficult teaching the French students. Uh, the, the, the international relations, they're, they're, they're somewhat critical of the United States, as you might have found. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and at Seance Poe, I used to emphasize the need for people to join some of the international organizations, like the UN and, and uh, so forth. And, and, uh, uh, to uh, there's the, the whole business of the international civil servant, and uh, I want some of you to consider that also. There's the UN you can apply for and work there. There's uh, all sorts of international agencies. There's the World Bank. The uh, uh, oh, I can't even begin to. Uh, I can't even begin to name all of them. And I must confess, right now, I've just momentarily forgotten your actual question. I'm, I'm sorry. Spot. I'm so glad. <laughs> <that you're laughs> It, it is a great institution. Oh, yes, the economic uncertainty with, uh, with uh, Bernie Sanders. Yes, so let me. Well, you know, Bernie Sanders is such a forceful speaker. But he's right. There is too much of a difference between the rich and the poor. And then there's too much. Uh, we're losing our middle class. And I'd say I agree with him there. Now, one of them is I believe that we should raise the tax rates on the very rich and on uh, and a lot of richer people. We have all this rules against no new taxation and uh, so forth. But I think that more of the burden, because uh, you know they had that debate when uh, Mitt Romney was running for president, the kind of job he had with the uh, Bain capital, they pay at a lower rate. I'm not picking up Mitt Romney, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but they do pay, and he said, yes, we do pay at a lower rate. They pay at the 15% rate, uh, whereas uh, my wife and I, we pay at about the 20 or 25 percent rate. Most of you will pay about 20 to 30 percent in taxes unless you get into investment banking. And uh, uh, there is need for tax reform. And I don't know why it is that everybody accepts no new taxes, uh, certainly not in the middle class, but uh, a lot of very wealthy people I know would be glad to pay more taxes. You know, but we have this top 10 percent who just really make out well. The children go to schools like this or the Ivy League and they're, they're in the system and uh, they can uh, uh, really do well and they inherit a little bit of money and they can invest that 
and uh, they really sail along pretty smoothly. But uh, somebody who starts out in the hard scrabble, lower middle income, or whatever, they can just they can be stuck there. There's a famous poem in uh, South Dakota, and this is a spiritual thing maybe. Uh, uh, it's about the high school prom queen in a small town, and she is the prom queen, and she's the most uh, famous person in the community when she's a senior in high school. And She's a cheerleader and she's sparkling and somehow she uh, goes astray and she uh, gets married to a, a local person. They, they have alcohol problems and, and she's, a, she's a waitress and she just never gets, she never gets to college. She's so promising. She never gets to vocational school. Now she's got two or three kids and her husband divorces her or whatever. The point is then she wakes up and she's 40 years old and she's an embittered uh, person who's still a waitress. and. Uh, there's a lot of that in different degrees. People are stuck, and uh, we have to find ways to move them out or, uh, or, or uh, to give them some assistance. And so Bernie Sanders is right there, and he has a he's, he's touched an immense chord, I think, in uh, in what he says with uh, people. He might not get that many votes, but I think a lot of people feel that, uh, and that's one of the big, the big challenges of your generation is to do something about this income disparity. And uh, I think we need higher wages. I also think we need higher taxes on the, on the uh, top 10 or 20 percent. And uh, that's just my approach. And, uh, uh, but we do need to do some things. I know we're out of time, but so I'll just let let you trying to get the last two questions. questions. I'll just let you yeah. do your questions. It's somewhat disheartening to me to see the widening divide between the two major political parties in the country. I'm just wondering what specific things you think we can do as BYU students now and over the next few years to bridge the gap between uh, the, the political parties? Well, there is a poisonous relationship between the Republican and Democratic parties, although both of them stand for almost the same thing now. It's really strange. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's part of the reason I ran as an independent. Uh, I'm part of the group. We're trying to get five independents elected to the United States Senate to try to break the poisonous deadline. And uh, we've got Angus King of Maine, he's an independent. We almost elected an independent in Kansas last time, and I would have been the third. A group of three to five people in the United States Senate in the middle might be able to break, the, break that deadline. What happened to Joe Lieber? What happened with the, we don't hear much about Joe Lieberman anymore. Yeah, Joe Lieber's a fine man from uh, Connecticut. Well, he's, he's kind of retired and uh, doing some teaching and kind of doing the same thing I'm doing. He was, uh, he was a man in the middle, I think. Uh, Joseph Bebel, I'm from Kansas City, and I'm a European Studies student uh, here at BYU. And maybe the reason why I'm asking this question is because I have studied Europe, I've studied electoral systems and kind of the way that they work in promoting democracy in European nations. And I guess this election with what's been going on and kind of the games that are being played within political parties, it brings into question maybe part of the legitimacy of our electoral system. Um, and do you think there's any possibility of maybe adjusting that? So as you said, more independence or more, uh, I guess, other political voices could be heard on the political spectrum, or are there other things that we could do other than just adjusting the electoral system? Well, um, th that's, a, that's a very good, that's a question for a, a long answer. But uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, the most basic thing is the level of apathy and the level of, of uh, People just don't uh, uh, care, and I'm very worried about that. Uh, there, uh, there has to be more work put into vote. Uh, the voters have to put more work into voting than just sitting there and, and listening to CNN and, and uh, Fox News and knowing these superficial things. A lot of people walking around, they think they're following politics if they follow the presidential race superficially, all this stuff that gets thrown around. And there isn't any study of U.S. Senate races, or U.S. House races, or the county commission races. Uh, you, citizens just have to inform themselves, and they can do it. Uh, they have computers, and there's information here and there, and they can go to meetings and uh, do a lot of things. So that's the most fundamental thing. So whatever the electoral system is, uh, I think that uh, that, that would be uh, something that we could change. Now, there are a whole series of other thing we could do, I cannot understand why we can't vote by computer. Uh, if they, if we were smart enough to have enough safety, whatever it 
database passwords or whatever. But if so some people want to vote by computer, I guess you can do that in Utah. I just heard that this morning somehow. I, I, I don't quite understand that. But to make it easier for people to vote, or vote on, on uh, weekends or leave votes and vote open for two or three days, or something like that. So that might help. But basically, it's just for citizens caring and for people wanting, and that's why I think it's so important that people like you but some spiritual basis. I, all through, although I just converted to Mormonism last year, but all my life, I, I, the only thing that gave me the strength to carry on a public service career is a belief in God and a belief that it was worth it to get up today and go out there and fight. And uh, I'm sort of a lower key type of a politician. Uh, and there are several. There are a lot of people that, that a lot of people in this room won't get much recognition. I'm kind of I'm a little lower on the radar screen than, than some. But I have a great satisfaction to know that I did the best I could. And uh, so whatever kind of electoral system we have, our people, we, we, this generation, we're, we're losing our country and we've got to change. I don't know how many of you heard Bishop Chapeau. I didn't, uh, I, I couldn't hear. He spoke so softly where I was sitting. I couldn't hear everything he said, but I think that was kind of his message today. So. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Senator Prosper. <laughs>